All right, uh, let's take care of a few business items first before we get started with today's fun and games. Um, you've got a paper coming up. We've discussed it as a teaching staff and we've decided to push it off a week. Of course, you can always turn it in sooner. <laughs> but we wanted, it, it's about poetry. And we're going to take the most challenging of the poets that we're going to have read up to that point and ask you to write about one of the poems that we're not doing in class. So we thought it might be a nice idea if all of you had at least one session um, in section in which you could talk about the analysis of poetry and particularly Puritan poetry and to sort of do the kind of analysis orally and together that you'll then be called upon to do in written form. So we're going to push that off, but I am going to make the assignment available online almost immediately after this class or later this afternoon, later this evening. Um, so that's one thing. At the same time, I'm also going to make available the scavenger hunt assignment, which isn't due then. It's due basically the Friday before the midterm. So there's more time for that. But it's a good thing to have in mind as a task as you begin the um, process of reading the poetry that we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks, in part because the poetry provides the most fertile ground, I think, for discovering the kinds of things that you're going to uh, be looking for. Uh, typically speaking, again, we're asking you to do something that's related to using the literature major's toolbox, uh, especially in formal terms. So we'll be asking you to look for stuff, um, a metrical foot, not an I am, but something else, like an Anapas trochee, dactyl, um, spondy. And we'll be asking you to look also for two other kinds of figurative language, figures of speech and figures of rhetoric. We'll give you a few of these to choose from. And the goal will not only be to find it, but to figure out what it's doing there. Or you might say to figure out what the effect is that the poet, so really you could use it from prose too, the writer in general, what, um, what effect is the writer getting out of the use of that particular metrical foot or rhetorical device in that moment? Right? So we'll be doing a little bit of, of, it's not only just finding, but it's talking about how it works. And of course, to talk about how it works, you'll need to be thinking about things like language, rhythm, syntax, diction, and also meaning. How is the way in which this meaning is being expressed affect the creation of that meaning itself? Okay, so that's... Um, we'll have both of those things available, um, and you'll be, you should take a look at them, if possible, before section um, this week, so even tonight, uh, so that you can, you can ask um, your section leader about questions that you might have, and there'll be an opportunity to do that next week as well. But um, I think, again, the point of these um, two assignments is to get you to be thinking about what it means to do close reading and to think about what's at stake in it. One thing I should say about the paper assignment is it has, a, it has a word limit indicated. We want you to adhere to that word limit. And uh, part of the reason for doing that is we basically want you to go through these poems when you read them and look, mine them for evidence of different kinds, evidence that has to do with meaning um, and evidence that has to do with formal attributes. We would love you to find more evidence that you can actually use and to have to take out some of the things that you might have used in order to fit it into the, the length. And we want you to make your best argument using your best evidence. Okay, but to start with that, you'll need to kind of make a catalog of the possible evidence that you could use. Okay, so we'll, have, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that as, the, course, as uh, the weeks go by. The second assignment in the course will ask you to do basically the same thing for a piece of prose rather than poetry. And then later on, you'll do a final paper of a topic of your own choosing in which we're hoping you'll put together the kinds of analysis that you've been doing in these shorter papers and be able to mobilize them in the service of a slightly longer um, argument of your own devising. Okay, are there any immediate questions about that? All right. In that case, we'll, plug, we'll uh, press on with the Puritans. Um, I fought the law. The law won, right? It almost always does. Um, antinomianism is one of our subjects for today, and it comes from the Greek words antinomos, which means against the law. And one of the things we're going to see is the way in which Anne Hutchinson sets herself against at least one version of what some Puritans think is the law. And hence, antinomian is a kind of derisive term that is applied to her and the people who were her followers. And later on, it becomes uh, something of a, a caution for people in the Romantic era. Both Emerson and Hawthorne are very aware of uh, 
the idea of antinomianism and want in some sense for Emerson, he wants to be, avoid being seen to be someone who follows that, in that tradition. Hawthorne has a more complicated relationship to antinomianism, as we will discover. But before we do that, I wanted to finish up some conceptual business from last time. So I'm going to show you a brief clip that I didn't have a chance to show last time, which comes from President Reagan. And it is his account of uh, Winthrop, when he finally names Winthrop and talks about him. But I also want you to just listen to the way this moment of his speech can be seen to work as a piece of rhetoric and to think about what it is that he's promoting in addition to you know, thinking about the individual and the community. So let's take a look at this together. I'm warning of an eradication of, that, of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Let's start with some basics. More attention to American history and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do. And that's about all I have to say tonight, except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we'd call a little wooden boat, and like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. The great communicator. And he had that kind of folksy, homespun, storyteller's way. George H.W. Bush tried to emulate him, but it didn't work so well. And you might say that George W. Bush, his real political father isn't his own father, but that guy, Ronald Reagan. And I, mean, I think that's that's what George W. Bush aspired to. That vision of America that Reagan had, it became a little bit, uh, let's just say in the years after that, maybe some of the assumptions that Reagan makes became a little bit more problematic. Um, so what, are, what is the vision of America that Reagan uh, talks about? I'm particularly interested in what you think some of the continuities and discontinuities might be with, say, Winthrop's vision of America. I already suggested to you one thing last time. Winthrop is promoting the idea of community over and above the idea of the individual. We're going to harness individual energies, 
but we're going to harness them. They're going to serve the community. They're going to save, serve God's purpose above all. Reagan changes things a little bit around. I mean, he, he sort of thinks that the starting point has to be the individual. And then it's almost like with the logic of laissez-faire, you start with the individual, let the individual pursue, pursue his or her senses of the good, her economic interests, and all good things will follow. But what else? What are some, did you notice some other things that he said about America or how to be American? Yeah. Okay, diversity. Different and then coming together. But his first point is it starts at the family table, which is interesting because that excludes, you know, I don't know, a percentage of people would not consider themselves to be part of a family table kind of atmosphere. But I mean, nowadays it's not uncommon to not have that family table kind of thing. So it's interesting to, to say this is where it begins and kind of inherently. All right, so there's a presumption of a typical uh, traditional American family perhaps, one that has the luxury of everybody gathering to table, the, the table, so clearly dad is not working the night shift and unable to be at the dinner or mom is able to, to be there and you know there's a certain, so there's, you can see that there's a certain idea of the family and I think you're right about that behind, behind that. But think about the logic of that then, if he begins with the family table and then he gets to the idea of diversity and, you know, he hasn't talked right in that moment about the individual, but you can see in his mind there's almost a kind of progression. Promote, promote individualism, we promote family life. Right? Why? Because you have kids and you want to care about them. And then ultimately we have a sense of the nation as one large family, you might say. There's an interesting analysis, which we'll probably talk about later in the term, of um, the fact that the family is an overriding metaphor for um, American people. And yet, one of the things we realize is when we start talking about families, and I think your, your um, point is getting at this, we, we may not all have the same idea of what constitutes a family or an ideal family in mind. And so we'll talk a little bit later on about really, dis, you know, there's that kind of powerful metaphorical language of the family, but the fact that it's a metaphor obscures the fact that people have radically different notions about whether a family should be run by, say, a strict father figure who is authoritarian and is kind of you know, like God's representative in the family unit, or by nurturing parents, both of whom are kind of equal, who are setting a model for behavior for their children rather than laying down, as it were, the law. So I think that's some things uh, to, to bear in mind. Yeah, what else? Did you have something you want to add? Well, Ray was talking about rewards being open. Mm -hmm. All right, so the doors were open for them. But you might say, yes, that idea of diversity is not something that comes along with Puritanism. So that would be another way I would, I would suggest in which Reagan is breaking with um, the Puritans, at least in rhetoric. Although, again, we might want to think about you know, how deep that commitment to diversity actually goes or what, what it is that Reagan thinks he means when you know, all these people are coming and what kinds of people are they going to be, really. There's a certain, there's a joke about the melting pot, which is, I don't even know who told this joke originally, that, you know, people come in from all different kinds of race, religions, and ethnicities, and basically everybody comes out Presbyterian, right? <laughs> the melting pot is a homogenizing pot. You all come out the same thing. Well, we have a different conception, I think, today of what diversity could and, and should mean. So that's one of the ways in which you might say Reagan. Reagan, that, that belongs to the moment before the so-called culture wars in this country, which take place kind of in, towards the end of Reaganism and then beyond, before multiculturalism be kind of, comes be kind of an assumption that most people have within um, institutions of higher education. So it's important to think about Reagan in that moment. Anything else? I think he is right about the sense of ritual, and I want to talk a little bit more about that today. And I think that's one of the ways in which there is a continuity between Reagan and the Puritans. Both of them understand the power of rituals. For him, it's kind of like daily rituals, like um, having the dinner tables together. For the Puritans, it was a larger sense of communal rituals, mostly oriented around the church and around sermons, and, um, and uh, of course around the communion table as well. So these are some of the things that I think we'll want to, to talk about. But before we go on to that, I wanted to just give you an example of the other kind of association in which uh, the Puritans were engaged when they came to the New World. This is just a description of the joint stock agreement that the Plymouth Puritans had when they came, right? So you can look at all the capitals invested by both merchants and the colonists. It's put into a joint fund, divided into shares. Every person over the age of 16 is rated at 10 pounds. 10 pounds is a single share. Any colonist outfitting himself 
uh, with 10 pounds worth of provisions was considered worth 20 pounds or a double share. For example, William Mullins, a well-to-do colonist, left in his will his stock of 40 pounds worth of boots and shoes, expecting it to increase to nine shares at the end of seven years. The investors who contributed only money and stayed at home and the colonists both were to continue the joint stock for even years during which all profits were made from trade, traffic, tra etc. Right? Then they would eventually divide up, oh, excuse me, that should be seven years. I think it was seven years during which all profits from trade would be in the common stock. And then they would eventually divide it all up, including the lands, houses, and the goods. And the common stock would furnish the food, clothing, and provisions during those seven years. And I think you can see that that's the that's a, a more extreme version of a kind of communal orientation that the Plymouth Puritans had. There were different provisions for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But again, they're very specific. They, indica they indicate um, you know, actual pounds worth of value, and they're thinking in economic terms. So for both Bradford and Winthrop, we want the economic arrangements uh, to reinforce the spiritual arrangements. But again, they belong to joint stock companies. It's an economic venture come to the new world as well as a spiritual venture. And I told you last time that one of the things that Winthrop is trying to do is to harness the uh, energies of the individual, probably the economic energies of the individual, in order to make this kind of arrangement work. And also, not get, you know, not so um, leave the individuals to pursue economic interests that the, the other kind of communal aspects of the venture would start to fail. So you need to make use of individualism, but find a way to rein it in. And so the antinomian controversy becomes an example of precisely the thing that is, you know, the, the, the subtext of Winthrop's sermon, what, he's, what it, is, it is he's afraid of um, happening, right? And in, ironically, it happens not because of economics, but because of doctrine, a theological doctrine and um, spirituality, right? But it is a case in which individualism is threatening to get out of hand. And what happens is the Puritan, the Puritan fathers, as it were, clamp down on it. And it's worth talking about that notion of Puritan fathers because anti um, the antinomian controversy is very much, to a, certain, to a, in a large case, a kind of feminist response to a patriarchal hierarchy. And it's quite clear that the people who were in charge of Puritan society at that point recognized it as such. It made a big difference that Anne Hutchinson was a woman mounting this particular challenge. Right? So that's what we call antinomianism. And this is a picture of Anne Hutchinson. Now, in order to understand the context for antinomian, we need, antinomianism, we need to go back to some of the things that Bruce Kuklick talked about in his, his article, particularly the idea of preparationism. Um, and preparationism is a way that the Puritans responded to the problem between, the problem of, you might say, the lack of fit between good works on the one hand, which you would think you know, Christians would be interested in promoting, and this idea of grace. But remember that for them, Arminianism, from the Dutch um, philosopher Jacob Arminius, the idea that you know, good works would be the way that you can get yourself, earn a place, merit salvation. For them, that's a heresy. Salvation occurs only because God is merciful, only because he gives grace to his chosen few, right? So there isn't a necessary connection between good works and the reception of grace, although I started to say last time why it was that the Puritans would probably not want to completely misbehave, because they would then be impulsing, um, interpreting their own impulses to misbehave as a sign that um, you weren't among the elect and nobody wanted that. So you might say that this idea of preparationism is another form of compromise, right? So the doctrine goes like this, since nobody can tell whether or not he or she is predestined to be a member of the elect, only God knows this, um, it made sense to engage in good moral behavior. Um, so you should live your life acknowledging God's supreme power. You should be looking for certain signs that the life of the sincere penitent, right, somebody who's accepting God's grace, would, um, would be exhibiting. Um, and among these would be, not surprisingly, a kind of yearning for grace, a natural inclination to good moral behavior and virtuous actions, right? You're wanting to be good could be interpreted as one of these signs. Now, none of these things would have any kind of causal efficacy. We've got to be clear about that. Can't merit grace. But they had this idea that you sort of could prepare for grace. As if, yeah, I don't know, grace were seeds that were going to be planted. I mean, 
And then if you were preparing for grace, you were just going to make sure the ground was especially receptive or fertile or well watered, or just so those seeds are going to take root right away. Right? If you think about the parable of the talents when, or, or the parable of the, se- the sower, when um, Christ talks about certain seeds are going to fall on rocky ground and certain seeds, and they're not going to prosper, certain seeds are going to prosper. Well, preparationism is the idea that you can prepare that ground and make sure that it's, you're going to, it's, grace is going to take root. It doesn't actually, from my point of view, make a lot of sense. I mean, when push comes to shove, there really isn't a way to prepare for grace. It really shouldn't make a difference whether you're prepared or not, right? Whether you're getting it or not, you're getting it, right? Yes, you wanted to say something. No, it's God's will. <laughs> it's anything but arbitrary. It's the most determined and reasonable thing there is. Because it's God's will. And who are you to ask about it at all? <laughs> you think I'm joking? That's really what they thought. I mean, who are you? Do you remember the book of Job? Anybody ever read the book of Job? Book of Job, okay? Book of Job is a wonderful book because it, 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 it gets at the problem of why is there evil in the world? Does anybody know why? And so we know about Job. And by the way, Job is a big intertext for Melville's Moby Dick. So, you know, if I, I should probably assign you to read the book of Job, but I won't. But it would be good if you were familiar with it. Anybody remember why Job gets tormented the way he does by God? Yeah. Isn't it because Satan was sort of goading God and saying, well, this guy loves you and worships you, but only Yeah, that's basically right. I mean, and we remember that the Satan that we see there is not Satan. Anybody ever watch reruns of Saturday Night Live? The word church lady mean anything to anybody? <laughs> okay, so Dana Carvey's wonderful. So, but Satan's not that Satan yet. Satan is still the kind of advocate, the adversary. It's almost like the devil's advocate that comes from that conception of Satan. He's going to pose the contrary just to test things out. So it's, yeah, Job, Job you know, is your faithful servant. Because God's saying, have you, Satan's gone walking around the earth looking at everything, and God's really proud of Job. He says, have you seen my faithful servant Job? Satan says, yeah, you know, your faithful servant Job, he only loves you because you've been good to him, and maybe he fears you a bit. You just take away all those good things, and we'll see. So God says, okay, test him. Don't kill him, but anything else you can do. So he does. <laughs> Right? And just in a series of like terrible disasters, Job is kind of sitting there one day, and then all these messengers come. And say, oh, you know, your, everybody in your family was killed. All your livestock was killed. And, and, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Okay, so it goes on. Right? But there's a reason for it. It's, it's a way of you know, testing God's principles. There's this, this, you know, this, it's almost like a thought experiment that God is allowing Satan to engage in. Right? Do you remember, we'll cut to the chase, do you remember what happens at the end? Does Job get to find out why this all happened to him? I mean, he's covered with boils and, yeah, what, what, what happens to Job? Um, God speaks to him. Okay. He, he tells him, who are you to pretend to understand uh, divine providence? Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. So you might say the nicest thing that God could do to Job, and Job, is, you know, Job never wants to ask to die or anything like Jonah does. Jonah's kind of a wuss, but Job, Job takes it, although he does complain, a little bit of whiny moments in, the, in, in Job's monologues, but for the most part, he, he comes, but he does, and he does, he does sort of register the unfairness. I mean, I can't really talk to you. You come, you speak in the whirlwind. Uh, you know, is that really fair? But okay. So anyway, he comes in. Now, the nice thing for God to do would be to explain it all. Look, this had a purpose. There was a reason. You were my representative. I've proven to Satan that my followers really believe and they have faith. And it's not because they, they either want rewards or because um, they fear me. Does he tell him all that? Does he give him that satisfaction of knowing that, there was, that it wasn't all arbitrary? He does not. Who are you to ask? Who are you to present? Were you around? When I created the world, were you around when I put Leviathan in the sea? No, quiet. And he smacks him down. And that is the way the Puritans understand the world. They trust that there is a purpose. They also understand that they are not going to know it. So you don't get to ask that question if you're a Puritan, and you wouldn't. Wanting to ask that question, very bad sign. <laughs> okay, so that, I mean, that, that's kind of, but that's where the precedent for it comes in books like the book of Job. That's the way that they understand the relation. Now that could drive some people to despair, although I think when we get to Edward Taylor, you will see that what he decides to 
to think about is that there's something fundamentally comic or comforting about the incommensurability between the divine mind and our own, right? It's kind of taken care of for us. We shouldn't worry about it. You shouldn't worry too much about grace not coming. It'll come, you know, and meanwhile, you sort of see human beings' predicament not as a predicament, but as, I don't know, an opportunity or the, the idea you have a kind of assurance that there's providence in place, right? So there's no connection between grace and works and preparationism is saying, well, there's kind of a little, of course it doesn't have any effect, but it's not a bad idea, right? I mean, even if you're not predestined for grace, if, if you've been preparing the way for grace and you don't get it still, you've been leading a good life and it's benefited to other people, so it's better than the opposite, right? But push it too far and it starts to look like Arminianism. And that's what Hutchinson said. I mean, basically, when preachers would get angry with one another, they would accuse one another of being Arminian. You know, they're falling, falling into the ar trap of the Arminian heresy and preaching a doctrine of works rather than grace. So Anne Hutchinson started to get disaffected with some of the preachers in Boston because she believed that they were, in fact, producing a doctrine that was very close to Arminianism. Too much preparationism, too little account of... Um, too little account of grace. And so she starts to create a kind of, well, it starts out as a kind of book group or reading group of her own, and then she gets a lot of followers. Um, Hutchinson and her family emigrated to Boston in 1634. She comes from a prominent family. Her husband, William, is elected, to the deputy, uh, is elected as a deputy of the Massachusetts court, and she is somebody who's very active in community service. She serves as a nurse and a midwife and a spiritual advisor to women, and in fact, that's where the problem sometimes starts. Sometimes in her first years in Boston, she began to hold these weekly meetings in her home to discuss um, the sermon of the previous Sunday. And they soon became very big. I mean, people heard about them and she would get about, you know, 60 people in her house, including the governor and other prominent figures. Now the trouble starts when she, start, when she begins to criticize some of the leading clergy for, for, for um, basically preaching what she thought of as a doctrine of works. Or she accused them of being legalists who suggested that people could earn salvation somehow and that the, conver the conversion process could in fact be charted and understood. She wanted to go back to the hardline, mainline Calvinism which regarded grace as inscrutable. That's a big word for the Puritans. Can't understand it. Inscrutable and individual. It's a mystical experience that happens only between God and the individual sinner. And then really, when you think about it, the clergy has no role to play in that fundamental act of the Christian life. You don't need the clergy. So all of this stuff, the clergy, the churches, the prayers, everything, she thought of as what is called sanctification. It's all, everything that has to do with good works and churchly trappings and all this kind of stuff, part of sanctification, which is all well and fine. I mean, insofar as it promotes good and behavior, that's great with her. But what she's really interested in and what she thinks of as the center of the Christian's life is justification. The moment when the Holy Spirit becomes indwelling, when you get grace, and she says there is no connection between justification and sanctification. Let's take a look, uh, and to say that, she says, is a form of Arminianism. Let's take a look on page 160 of the Norton. There's a, a moment, we looked at the moment of the snake and the mouse last time, but let's take a look at another moment from Winthrop's journal in which he talks about Anna Hutchinson. This is on page 160 at the bottom, the entry that's October 21, 1636. And he writes this, one Mrs. Hutchinson, a member of the Church of Boston, a woman of ready wit and bold spirit, brought over with her two dangerous errors. One, that the person of the Holy Ghost dwells in a justified person. That's a kind of obscure point of doctrine. And this is the bigger problem, right? Two, that no sanctification can help to evidence to us our justification. From these two grew many branches as one, our union with the Holy Ghost, so as a Christian remains dead in every spiritual action, hath no gifts nor graces, other than such as are in hypocrites, nor any other sanctification but the Holy Ghost himself. There joined with her in these opinions a brother of hers, one Mr. Realwright, a silenced minister sometime in England. Right? So Winthrop is noting this. And you can see that the problem that, that they have is that if you push this doctrine, which you might say is a kind of, 
within Puritan terms, a kind of right-wing conservative doctrine. It's the most conservative interpretation of um, Calvinism. If you push it too far, you don't need the minister. You don't really even need the sermon. You don't need any of the church hierarchy. All you need is your own sense of uh, your, your leading a Christian life and your expectation that ultimately you will, you will receive grace. So she's mounting a challenge, you might say, to the church hierarchy by preaching this. And people are starting to listen to her. So finally, they find a way to try her. She's tried twice. She's tried once in the civil court, the general court in 1637. She's tried by the spring, in the next spring by the church. Um, she refuses to confess the errors of her ways. And finally, if you look at some of the transcripts, you'll see that she gets caught up on a kind of arcane point of doctrine. Ultimately, she and her family are banished in 1638. Uh, to Rhode Island, right? So they clamp down. Now, the earliest sermon that still survives from Puritan Plymouth is one that's called The Sin and Dangers of Self-Love. And it was, it was um, preached by a guy named Robert Cushman. And it was preached in 1620. Interestingly, again, there's a kind of, you know, Cushman had sort of split interests. He was a Puritan and therefore got to preach this, this lay sermon because he was the business agent for the colony. So he was going back to England, and before he goes, he wants to make sure that everything is ship shape with that agreement that they have made with uh, the investors back home. Right? So the, the problem, the biggest threat to um, the Puritan enterprise is going to be this idea of self-love or egotism, and he wants to preach against that. Yes? They, they tried her for these errors, what they considered to be errors of doctrine and preaching against um, the ways in which the, the, the uh, ministers were preaching. So if you look at the, the two things that um, Winthrop identifies here are the reasons that they try her in, in court. Um, the idea that the person of the Holy Ghost dwells in a justified person. Um, and so that it's a question of, is the Holy Ghost outside or is it actually inside? And I believe she says it's inside and they didn't want to say it. I mean, that's the obscure point of, of doctrine. But the other thing is important, even perhaps more important, that no sanctification can help to evidence us to our justification, right? Because they are developing this doctrine that goes by the name of preparationism. And that doctrine is the official doctrine. You're not supposed to challenge that, even to say that it doesn't exactly make sense. Or, so when she starts to challenge that, that becomes a reason for, her, for them to, to bring her up. Uh, and to try her in uh, both of these courts. Um, I, I don't remember what the, I'll, I'll check it out and see if I can put it in the notes. I don't remember what the actual charge in the civil court was. It was something akin to disorderly conduct, but it was, it was really, it was basically be, for pr promoting dangerous heresies among the people. So that was both a civil offense and a theological event, um, offense. And it, there's a very complicated thing that goes on. John Cotton is a good friend of hers. She kind of saves some of the, the ministers who are interested by, by claiming that they aren't culpable at all, that it's all, you know, it's just her own idea. And ultimately, she's the one that suffers most of the, most of the, the punishment, she and her, her family. But the point is, therefore, that self-love, egotism, are, is the thing that they're afraid of. And so they kind of suggest that that's what she's preaching. Even though, when, if you were looking at it on the face of it, you would say, she's really just preaching the doctrine. The problem is that in trying to make the doctrine something that could serve as the template for a society, in some senses, they have to compromise the doctrine. There needs to be a place for the kind of disciplinary powers of the church and the elders to, to be. And Hutchinson wants to say, you know, that, that's kind of irrelevant. Um, so they, they saw it as you know, a form of individualism or egotism getting out of hand. They thought she was doing it for impure motives because she declared that the church, which thought of itself as having this mediating role between the individual sinner and God, was actually unnecessary. So you see there's a kind of double offense. It's theological, but it's also social and ideological. I mean, she's going up against the church hierarchy on these grounds of doctrine. And more than that, as I suggested earlier, she's a woman who is openly challenging patriarchal structures. And if you look at the things that they write about it, and we'll look at a snippet right now, you can see that the, her gender is clearly an issue. Take a look on page 163. There's, a, en uh, there's an entry about, after, later on, there's an entry about her child and the monstrous birth that is attributed to her. 
So September 1638, Mrs. Hutchinson being removed to the Isle of Aquidae in the Narragansett Bay, after her time was fulfilled that she expected deliverance of a child, was delivered of a monstrous birth. Hereupon the governor wrote to Mr. Clark, a physician and a preacher to those of the island, to know the certainty thereof, who returned him this answer. And there's this kind of weird, prurient interest in what's going on. I mean, Mrs. Hutchinson, six weeks before her delivery, perceived her body to be greatly distempered and her spirits falling, and in that regard, doubtful of life. She sent to me, etc., and not long after, in immoderato fluore uterino, it was brought to light, and I was called to see it, where I beheld innumerable distinct bodies in the form of a globe, not unlike the swims of some fish, so confusedly knit together by so many several strings, which I conceived were the beginnings of veins and nerves, so that it was impossible either to number the small round pieces in every lump, much less to discern from whence every string did fetch its original, they were so snarled within one another. The small globes I likewise opened and perceived the matter of them setting aside the membrane in which it was involved to be partly wind and partly water. The governor, who not satisfied with this relation, spake after with the said Mr. Clark, who thus cleared all the doubts. I mean, they want details of the monstrous birth. The lumps were 26 or 27, distinct and not joined together. There came no secondine after them. Six of them were as great as his fist and the smallest about the bigness of the top of his thumb. The globes were round things included in the lumps about the bigness of a small Indian bean, and like the pearl in a man's eye, the two lumps which differed from the rest were like liver or congealed blood and had no small globes in them as the rest had." Okay, you can see that the kind of interest in this, and the fixation on that idea, here's this woman and she's delivered this monstrous birth. I mean, only, the only thing better would have been if she delivered an actual devil child that was walking around, right? But they could, you can see that interest is linked to the fact that they understand that she has committed a kind of gender offense an offense against their hierarchy of gender. And so that, that comes across, I think, in the language that they use, the way in which they're particularly interested in the facts of her failed maternity in this, in this instance. Um, so the Hutchinson spent about five years in um, Rhode Island, and then they moved actually up to Pelham in the Bronx. And on page 164, you can find out what happens to them. This is the middle of the page, September 1643. The Indians near the Dutch, having killed 15 men, began to set upon the English who dwelt under the Dutch. They came to Mrs. Hutchinson's in a way of a friendly neighborhood, as they had been accustomed, and taking their opportunity, killed her and Mr. Collins, her son-in-law, who had been kept prisoner in Boston, as it was before related, and all her family and such other families that were, as were at home in all 16, and put their cattle into their houses and there burnt them. These people had cast off ordinances and churches, and now at last their own people, and for larger accommodation had subjected themselves to the Dutch and dwelt scatteringly near a mile asunder. She deserved what she got. Right, is the message here. In other words, they see, they, you know, they looked at what happened to her, and they saw it as a sign of God's divine judgment. That she was wrong, and therefore she had this fate. Um, so you would say her old enemies would have been satisfied. Um, by this outcome, and it would be a further, inter you know, further justification for them of the way they think about history. That history is not secular, but history is part of a divine plan that's unfolding. Yeah. Again, you're asking about God's purpose. <laughs> it's a big black hole. You do not get to ask about that. God has his purposes. Who are you to presume? He's seen the past, the present, the future. He knows. It's all part of a plan. And we call it providence. Wouldn't it be a sin to presume that she died because of what she had done? Yeah, probably, except that it suits their purposes. You know, yeah. Right? I mean, one of the things that you would say about this is, so, I mean, I don't... I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not even really religious myself, let alone subscribing to a form of fundamentalism like this. It made sense to them. And part of it was because there were certain lines that were drawn beyond which you wouldn't cross with reason. You only got to the other side by faith. So you just had faith. And so you had an intuition about something, right? I mean, that's the point of it, that God has an invisible church. What we have is a visible church. Puritans are trying to make those two match up as much as possible. So they have some ideas that some people are going to be, Winthrop, yeah, he's in the church. Bradford, sure, church. You know, part of a problem arises later with the second generation. They're not so sure about them. Are they going to be part of it? But they intuit these things. So then you have these intuitions, then you look for signs. You try to interpret things so that that might be a sign of divine approval. 
So this would be a sign of divine disapproval. Again, you're trained just as preparation as himself. You could say if you were absolutely hardline, you shouldn't even be thinking about this. Right? Because you're treading on God's ground. God knows and you should. But insofar as you could say that's a sign, it seems like we're not presuming to ask why or to question the purposes, but it looks like God is approving these things. That's the way they thought. They live in a kind of haunted world where they are sure of the larger outlines of the story. They even know the end of the story. It's called the book of Revelation. It's the apocalypse. They even know the role that the, they play as a people in that. What they don't know, what no individual knows, is the role that he or she is going to play. Right? So you run into various kinds of theological problems. They try to get around these. Yeah. <laughs> you still wouldn't know exactly until you'd actually had the experience of grace. See, here's the rub. Then they actually feel like they have the experience of grace. Um, in order, after the antinomian controversy, in order to try to settle things down a little bit, and so that someone like another Hutchinson couldn't long, come along and say, look, grace is inscrutable, you know, uh, you, who nobody can say whether you've had it or have they start to develop, and again, this would seem to us to be counterintuitive, and certainly to Hutchinson, they start to develop a series of steps by which the individual sinner and those around him or her could recognize that you've received grace. And historians, following somebody named Edmund Morgan, have said that they, they call this a kind of morphology of conversion. And, and these are kind of squishy steps, but Morgan said that the steps towards the reception of, of grace were something like this. Knowledge, conviction, faith combat and true imperfect assurance. Now, you, he would he derived these by looking at lots of different conversion narratives. Because one of the things that came after this is the idea that in order to have full church membership, you had to give an account of your conversion. And how could anybody know if you were telling the truth or not? Well, it's because people had an idea of what a real conversion would look like. And so if your conversion matched their idea, your account convincingly matched their idea of what it was, it was going to be OK. And I just want you to look at this, this stuff. When we get to Edwards, you'll, this will become a little clearer, I think. But there's a sense in which we start off with knowledge, right? So that might be something like knowing the Bible, listening to the, the, the ministers, understanding the principles. And we believe as a result of that. We move from a, a strong belief to actual faith that's beyond questioning or reason. And then something happens to us and we are forced to question everything or we're forced to put those principles into place. We're severely tempted or members of our family die or something like that happens. We have this kind of struggle. And as a result of that struggle, we emerge stronger. We emerge with an assurance that's true, but we're always aware of its imperfection. It's the same logic I talked about before in moving from the covenant of works down to total depravity up to the covenant of grace. You start off at a place that's okay, you're tested, things get bad, and you rise to a place that's much higher. It's that same kind of, of Puritan logic. Um, and so I think it looks almost like a square root sign or something like that. Anyway, that's, that's one of the things they try to do. They try to develop a series of steps whereby you could actually tell. And so then they come up with this idea. It's called the Cambridge Platform 1648, which they say all of these conversions must be personal and public. Personal meaning you have, to recount, you have to recount your own story of conversion, but public because you have to tell everybody else about it. Sometimes women who were afraid, you know, as women are, of speaking in public, they were allowed to have somebody else recount it for them. And many of these things were written down, and so we have um, some of them. Um, John Cotton, who was actually um, one of the people that was in Hutchinson's circle for a while and was a conservative minister, wrote this tract called The True Constitution of a Particular Visible Church. Again, you can see that terminology here, in which he gave a kind of question and answer, sort of an early FAQ for how do you know all the mechanics of being saved and not saved and what you can know. So, question, what manner of men hath God appointed to be received as brethren and members of his church? Answer, such as are called out of God of this world to the fellowship of Christ, and do willingly offer and join themselves first to the Lord and then to the church by confession of their sins, by profession of their faith, and by laying or taking hold of his covenant. And this doesn't actually map onto this. This are the things that you do after you've received this true and perfect assurance, right? So there's sort of steps. 
In an earlier tract, he's made it even a little clearer what they did. Candidates are called for before the church, and each one maketh confession of his sins and profession of his faith. In confession of his sins, that it may appear to be a penitent confession, he declareth also the grace of God to his soul, drawing him out of his sinful estate into fellowship with Christ. In the profession of his faith, he declareth not only his good knowledge of the principles of religion, not only knowledge, but also his professed subjection to the gospel of Christ with his desire of walking here therein with the fellowship of the church. So again, you get the sense that knowledge isn't enough. There's got to be something more, and that something more is what you get um, when you get to the experience of grace. Edwards is a very late Puritan, by the way. I mean, this is, he's writing 100 years after these people, um, and he's the last great Puritan thinker, I suppose. But in some of the things that you'll read, you'll get a sense of what, it, what you know, he's trying to get across, but he uses language that's much more familiar to us because it's a, a, just, it's a kind of proto-romantic language that at that time feels licensed to use examples from cultural life or from nature to get across what it is. But let's just say, anybody seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? Yes? yes. People still watch The Wizard of Oz? <laughs> well, before Grace, the world is black and white. After Grace... Technicolor, and you don't have to go back to Kansas because Oz is better. That's grace, okay? So we'll talk about that some more. But so you see, I want you to see how it is. They're trying to figure out a way to make this rather impractical doctrine work in practical terms as the basis um, for a society. And so they come up with these various kind of compromise positions. And part of what happens is that these things, this whole idea of a morphology of conversion and other things, um, become more and more standardized as they encounter more and more problems in Puritan New England. These include problems with the weather. There are earthquakes and bad weather and failed crops. Yes, there actually are earthquakes in New England, not the way there are some other places, but they did occur. Experienced one myself back in the day had been out for a while the night before, so I thought it was something else when I woke up. <laughs> but when you see that the room is not at right angles to itself, you kind of figure out that it's just an earthquake. <laughs> anyway, one problem, as I've already hinted at, is that there was a problem with the second generation. The children of these supposed saints of the first generation were not getting converted at the rate they should have been. So they came up with this idea called the halfway covenant by its opponents, in which they said, look, we'll meet you halfway. No, they didn't say that. What they said was that the, the, the children of full church members could have their children baptized, and they could have all many of the rights and benefits. They couldn't go to the communion table yet until they fully received church membership. But you know, you got to be baptized. You gotta, children's got to be baptized, because if you're not baptized, it's kind of a non-starter. Not that baptism has any efficacy or anything, right? I mean, because you're baptized, you're not causing anything or creating anything, but let's just say if it turns out that you weren't baptized, that would be the surest sign that you weren't among the elect. So you really want to make sure your kid is baptized. Okay, so that's another example, and Puclick talks about this. That's another example of the way in which Puritans are trying to make the, create these compromised positions that can make their society work. A form that arises as a result of these problems that Puritan New England is having is a form that's called the Jeremiad. And it's a particular kind of sermon. Um, once a year in front of the general court, something called an election sermon was, and that's elect, was preached. And that's election in the sense of being among the elect rather than voting for anything. And this form called the Jeremiah arose in, in part in response to the troubles that New England was having. And as you might imagine, it was a kind of sermon that took as its text Jeremiah or sometimes Isaiah, you know, the Old Testament prophets who are constantly decrying the failure of the Israelites to keep their covenant, right? The prophets were howling in the wilderness, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's them. So it's a kind of gloomy sermon. And the paradigmatic one is one that was preached in 1670 in front of the, of the general court um, by a man named Samuel Danforth. And it was called A Brief Recognition of New England's um, Errand into the Wilderness. And uh, you might say that the content of these sermons was expected to integrate a kind of theory of Puritan society with current and religious social practices. That's what the election sermons tended to do. Um, so you got a kind of familiar ritual 
in which the preacher would pick a text, summarize the larger historical pig, picture, take stock, and then find some way to, to apply it. And it typically followed the pattern of um, text, explication, doctrine, reasons and propositions, and then application that I set out last time. Um, the application became more and more important as Puritan New England started to have problems. And so we would see in Danforth's sermon this same kind of, of pattern. He gave it to the Massachusetts General Court in 1670, and the larger question he was asking was this, what is it that distinguisheth New England from other colonies and plantations in America? And of course, the answer is what makes Puritan New England distinctive is exactly the thing that Winthrop talked about. It's the fact of its pursuit of religious ends that will make it this kind of shit city on a hill. So I'm going to show you a passage, a very brief passage from Danforth's sermon, and you'll see how he's taking cues from texts like Bradford's with their depiction of the howling wilderness into which the Puritans have come on this errand, and also Winthrop, this idea of serving as a model or a beacon and having made a kind of covenant. So this is part of Danforth's sermon. You have solemnly professed before God, angels, and man that the cause of your leaving your country, kindred and fathers' houses, and transporting yourselves with your wives, little ones, and substance over the vast ocean into this waste and howling wilderness was your liberty to walk in the faith of the gospel with all good conscience according to the order of the gospel and your enjoyment of the pure worship of God according to his institution, institution without humane mixtures and impositions, right? This is why you've wanted to do this. Good conscience. And he talks further on about this kind of compact that you've made. And for a while, he says, it worked. When the people were saintly and the first generation was there, we created out of this howling wilderness a kind of garden. But we have not been tending our garden properly. And he, he takes uh, as an additional text from Proverbs, the vineyard is all overgrown with thorns and nettles cover the face thereof and the stone wall is broken down. Right? We, things are not good. Yes? I still don't understand why there would be a problem with the second generation. You know, how do they know that the first generation is more chosen than the second generation? Well, the, the first generation were A, the leaders, so you didn't really question them very much, and B, they all had these professions of faith and they were part of church members and the second generation became interested in other things. They actually became interested in exactly the things that Winthrop was afraid of. They were more interested in their economic lives perhaps than their spirituality. There were fewer confessions or professions of faith. You know, it's like kids these days. It's, it was in some sense it's an abiding problem but they said it in this religious context. So he, they're saying like, okay, now we understand why there are the earthquakes and Indian troubles and bad crops and all this stuff. Why has the Lord smitten us with blasting and mildew now seven years together, adding sometimes severe drought, sometimes great tempests, floods and sweeping rains, blazing stars, earthquakes, dreadful thunders, lightnings, fearful burnings, right? The very, it's like one of these moments from a Shakespearean play, the very earth is erupting because of the bad stuff that the Puritans are doing. Every week, this became a kind of ritual after this. It's like every week these sermons would be, whenever you'd go to, to church, you'd be hearing these kind of Jeremiah's preached over and over and over again. And you'd find it very depressing, right? Well, they didn't, I don't think. And what we think is that they started to understand that this was a ritual. And it's been described by American, scholar, American scholars as a ritual of consensus. Because remember the logic, God afflictest most those whom he loves best. The worse it is, the more he loves you. Think Job. And these sermons, which were constantly, you know, excoriating those present for their failure to live up to the ideals of the fathers, every week they would also end with the idea that it's not too late. You still are the chosen people. Get back with it and everything will be fine. God's grace is waiting for us there. Don't ask questions about efficacy, please. This is, the, this is the, the, the rhetoric of it, right? We're still the chosen people. Time to, to get back to where we're supposed to be, right? So there, it was a constant reinforcement of the idea that, God's, that the Puritans were God's chosen, that they, were, they had a role to play in the end of days, and the end of days were coming pretty soon. So pretty, you know, in general, best not to be caught out when the end of days comes. Okay. <laughs> Are there questions about that? Yeah. Well, no, the children of full church members 
were allowed to have most of the privileges that ch full church members could have. They couldn't go to the communion table, but they could do some of these other things like participate and also, bap most important, baptize their children. Oh, they, can baptize their children. they can baptize their children even if they're not full church members because there was the expectation that if, you know, if you're Winthrop's kid, you're going to get converted. It just might be taking a little bit longer. How was the Well, again, you know, to say that baptism caused election or anything like that it would be to preach a doctrine of works somehow. So it's not that. It's just, it's more like you have to think of a retrospective logic. If it turns out that you weren't baptized, that's a pretty good sign that you're not among the elect. Again, don't think too much about where the human agency falls within this. You're so, you're all, they all hate this, right? Bitch to your section leaders about it. <laughs> But I mean, one of, my, one of my things I'm saying is there are, the Puritanism is full of contradictions and they struggle with it. I mean, one of the earliest ways that people thought about Puritanism was it was kind of fundamentalism, it was a kind of monolith, everybody believed. But for example, a history of New England Puritanism would look a lot different if you started not with Winthrop as we're doing, but say with accounts of the Salem witch trials. You would get some of the same elements in place, but they would take on a much more sinister kind of cast in which there are certain kinds of enthusiastic behaviors and it kind of works almost virally. People start to, to believe that they've seen things. And later on, in the, if you read the transcripts of, the, of, of Salem, what you'll realize is that the people who are saved are the people that say, I'm guilty. And I saw the black woman with the, and the black man with the cat on his shoulder and I, whatever it is, they figure out that there's certain signs, not unlike the kind of flip side of the morphology of conversion. I say these things and then say, I'm sorry about it. It's better than saying, what are you talking about? I'm innocent. It's the people that continue to profess their innocence till the very end. And Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, is a wonderful 20th century capturing of this kind of hysteria and of the refusal to, to kowtow to this kind of ritualized behavior. The people that profess their innocence, they're the ones that died. Right? So New England becomes a very kind of ritualized society and people start to understand the way these, these rituals work. All right. One other thing to say about the Jeremiah is it becomes a form that you might say explodes beyond the boundaries of simply the sermon. And that many things beyond sermons start to take on this powerful kind of Jeremiahic form. We will read one of them next week, which is Michael Wigglesworth's um, poem, The Day of Doom, which takes basically the form of a kind of instruction manual to, intended mostly for young readers. It was written in a verse form that was very easy to memorize. And it, of course, ends with the idea of God's grace, but that's like 10 verses out of 300. The rest of it, all hellfire and damnation, right? A lot of, lot of Jeremiahic kinds of elements. And some people have, re have read the longer thing that we looked at for today also as a Jeremiah, the narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. So let's turn to that on page 236 of the Norton. And this is a picture of Mary Rowlandson from a later edition. Actually, they make her look more colonial, probably. I mean, like kind of later colonial than she probably did. Um, but Rowlandson is, uh, is, is thought of as the kind of paradigmatic captivity narrative. And many of these things often follow the kind of Jeremiahic design in which somebody has a captivity happen, and they say, they berate themselves, take responsibility for it, say it's some kind of failing, I'm being punished or I'm being tested and then ultimately since you only get to write a captivity narrative if you're redeemed from your captivity, you find that in fact you know, things have worked out well and that, that God has saved you. Um, Rowlandson's captivity occurs during something that's known as King Philip's War, uh, which erupts in 1675 and proves to be devastating both, for both sides. Um, under the leadership of um, Chief Sachem Metacomet of the Wampanoag, several Native American tribes band together finally um, to keep, basically, to keep the Puritans in check. I mean, they see, if they, you imagine their, their situation. They've been living here. They see these Puritans coming. They're taking control of the land. They have larger and larger settlements. They're increasing uh, in number. They're pushing these tribes out of their homelands. So there's 18 months of sighting in which both sides engage apparently in atrocities and suffer high casualties and the economy of, of New, the New English colony is completely disrupted. Um, you can imagine a major refugee situation around Boston as a result of this. Um, Metacomet is finally killed which marks the end, effective end of native resistance to the English. You might say the English win 
but it's a kind of Pyrrhic victory. Um, and people, social and economic historians suggest that the end of, of Puritan New England comes um, in part or in large part because of the effects of uh, King Philip's War. All right, February 10th, 1676, a Wampanoag raiding party attacks Lancaster, um, kills 12 citizens, burns their homes, takes Mary and 23 others captive. Um, Mary's brother-in-law, her elder sister, her sister's son are all killed, and her youngest daughter, six-year-old Sarah, whom she's holding in her arms, is fatally wounded by a bullet that also passes through Mary's side. Rowlandson carries her daughter, as you know from the account, for eight days uh, until she, the daughter dies on February 18th. She has two other children, 10-year-old Mary, 13-year-old Joseph. They are kept apart from her during the captivity, although she reports that she did see them. And they're eventually all ransomed about three months three months later in May. So when she lived, during her captivity, she lived with and was the servant of Quanapen, who was a chief of the Narragansetts, and in fact was the leader of the raiding party on Lancaster and with his wife. Okay, after that the Rowlandses live in Boston for a year and then her husband becomes minister to the church in Wethersfield, Connecticut. And it's some years after, some time after this, probably at least a year, uh, maybe two, that she starts to begin writing this narrative. We know it has to be no more than two because her husband dies in 1678. And in fact, the last public record of Mary, we don't know what happens to her, occurs in 1679 when she's given some money for his funeral. Um, and until recently, historians assume that she probably died sometime before the narrative was actually published in 1682, but there's actually new evidence that suggests she might have been remarried. Um, and that she lived in Wethersfield, Connecticut until 1711 when she died at the age of 73. So, unclear about the, com completely about the faith, the fate of Mary Rowlandson. Now, it's interesting to think about what's going on in this narrative. She was encouraged to write it by Increase Mather, the father of Cotton Mather, who was a prominent, uh, prominent minister and who was also a historian. He'd written a history of King Philip's War. And both the point of his history and the point of Rowlandson's narrative is to find some kind of providential understanding of the war, to convince people both in England and in the Americas um, that New England was still okay, that Puritan New England was still okay after the war, and that the, their ordeal was justified. Now take a look at the title page of this. What do you notice about the title page of this compared with the first page of your, of the narrative that we had you read. What's the title of this narrative? Yes, that's right. It is. The sovereignty and goodness of God together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed. So it's often in anthologies referred to in a shorthand as a narrative of the captivity and res um, the, cap the captivity and restoration, it's spelled in a different way, of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. But that's not the real title. The title we'll use is The Sovereignty and Goodness of God. Okay, what else might we notice about this title page? Footnote gives you the full title. The Sovereignty and Goodness of God together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, commended by her to all that desire to know the Lord's doings to and dealings with her, especially to her dear children and relations. The second edition corrected and amended, written by her own hand for her private use and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends and for the benefit of the afflicted. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any can deliver out of my hand. All right, look at the structure of that. What do you notice about it? What's that? It is a sermonic setup, complete with a um, reference to the Bible. What else? Anything? Where is Rowlandson in it? She comes kind of late in the title, doesn't she? So it's the sovereignty and goodness of God here and then God here, and she gets Mary Rowlandson here and her family. But what I want you to see is that her narrative is quite literally, even by the title, framed by a theological context. It's about God. 
at the beginning and the end. And she has one little role to play inside. So that's one of the things to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind is that the narrative itself is also framed by the doctrinal and by the patriarchal. It's introduced by Increase Mather, and then there's a sermonic afterward by her, son, her, her husband, Joseph, as well. Right? So that her own text is also bookended and framed by narratives that have to do with God and that are written by men, as if she needs to be authorized to speak. And this is the first you know, big prose thing by a woman that is um, published in the colonies. So it is a kind of unprecedented um, narrative uh, to appear. And one of the things that, that Mather and Mr. Reverend Rowlandson are trying to do is give you a way of reading it. Right, so its purposes are set for you as a reader even before you begin to read her narrative of the 10th of February, 1675. Right, we are taught how to read the narrative. We are taught how to read the war that it is a part of. She has no sense throughout the narrative that there are larger social and political contexts for the war. Right, doesn't have any sense that this is really this is an episode within a larger conflict between the settlers of Puritan New England and a larger Indian tribe. In fact. Her understandings of the, the natives are almost wholly at the beginning in line with the kind of uh, representation of natives that we see in Bradford. Let's take a look, so on page, say, I don't know, 237, as she's talking about her account. This is about 10 lines down or, or so. Um, no sooner were we out of the house but my brother-in-law being before wounded in defending of the house in or near the throat, fell down dead, whereat the Indians scornfully shouted and halloed and were presently upon him, stripping off his clothes, the bullets flying thick. One went through my side, and the same as would seem through the bowels and hand of my dear child in my arms. One of my elder sister's children named William had his leg broken, which the Indians perceiving they knocked him on his head. Thus we were, butcher were we butchered by those merciless heathen, standing amazed with the blood running down to our heels. My eldest sister being yet in the house and seeing these woeful sights, the infidels hauling mothers one way and children another, some wallowing in their blood, and her elder son telling her that her son William was dead and myself was wounded, she said, and Lord, let me die with them. So what you get here is a depiction of the Indians as heathens, as savages. Look at the bottom of the page. It is a solemn sight to see so many Christians lying in their blood, some here and some there like a company of sheep torn by wolves, all of them stripped naked by a company of hellhounds, roaring, singing, ranting, insulting, as if they would have torn our very hearts out. Yet the Lord, by his almighty power, preserved a number of us from death, for there were 24 of us taken alive and carried captive. So it's a horrible thing that happens to her. She tries to figure out a way of understanding what has happened to her. What does she come up with, do you remember? What does she do wrong? Why does she deserve this kind of punishment? Yeah. She keep the days? Yeah, she didn't quite keep the Sabbath as holy as she might have. Anything else? Um, that's well, that's on 239. Let's take a look at that. This is about 10 lines from the bottom. The next day was the Sabbath. I then remembered how careless I had been of God's holy time, how many Sabbaths I had spent, lost and misspent, and how evilly I had walked in God's sight, which lay so close unto my spirit, that it was easy for me to see how righteous it was with God to cut off the thread of my life and cast me out of his presence forever. Okay, anything else? Anything, any other naughty bits? Well, let's see. There is a bit about smoking. She does a little, she likes smoking every now and then. But I think when you look at it, you would find that the reasons that she has given somehow seem insufficient for the punishment that she has received. It doesn't seem to be quite enough to justify it, right? And yet that's what it is. She says the, the thing that most worried her was that she'd been cast out of God's sight, right? It isn't the punishment. It's the idea that maybe God has forgotten about her that she's no longer part of the chosen people for whatever reason. And then what happens? She receives a Bible, and she reads in it, and she starts to you know, find comfort. Now, I want you to think, as you're thinking about this, about the portrayal of the Indians. 
She starts in a certain place with the Indians as kind of uh, savages, right, and hellhounds, and just the instruments of divine wrath. But as the, the narrative continues, they change a little bit. Take a look on page 253 in the 14th remove. The end of the 14th remove, she says, Thus the Lord dealt mercifully with me many times, and I fared better than many of them. In the morning they took the blood of the deer and put it into a paunch and so boiled it. I could eat nothing of that, though they ate it sweetly. And yet they were so nice in other things, right? That's barbaric, it seems. That when I had fetched water and had put the dish I dipped the water with into the kettle of water which I brought, they would say they would knock me down for they said it was a sluttish trick. In other words, they have manners, they have customs, and she starts to realize what they are. There are certain moments in this when she is the one that seems uncivilized in comparison to them. There are little reversals that the text records. More than that, when we finally meet in the, the 19th remove, King Philip, who is completely demonized by um, the Puritans, does he seem like a demon? Not exactly. This is about 10 lines down. Going along, having indeed my life, but little spirit, Philip, who was in the company, came up and took me by the hand and said, two weeks more and you shall be mistress again. I asked him if he spake true, and he, said, he answered, yes, and quickly you shall come to your master again, who had been gone from us three weeks. After many weary steps, we came to Wachusett, where he, her Indian master, was, and I was glad to see him. He asked me when I washed me. I told him not this much. Month. Then he fetched me some water himself and bid me wash and gave me glass to see how I looked and bid his squaw give me something to eat. So she gave me a mess of beans and meat and me a little ground nut cake. I was wonderfully revived with this favor showed me. And again, she has a biblical parallel for this. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carry them captives from the Psalms. One of the crucial things to see as you look over this narrative again is the moment at which the natives become more than just hellhounds for her is the moment in which she figures out that she can trade with them. She can engage and barter for things. She begins, in other words, to see that they, or to intuit, she can't actually use language to say this, but she begins to intuit that they have a kind of economy, that they have a culture, and she can partake in them. So they get names, and it's precisely a result of these kind of economic transactions. I'll point some of these out to you in the notes and you can look at them. Um, that's one thing to understand, therefore. There's a kind of set of subtexts that run through this text that are, in some sense, counter to the doctrinal meanings that Mather and her husband are trying to establish as context. This idea of economic agency is one of them. And the other thing that you should look for as you read the text is moments when real grief seems to be coming through. Right? She's supposed to process this grief in an almost impersonal way. It's not supposed to be about her and her own terrible experiences. It's supposed to have a doctrinal meaning. Yet you should look for those moments where somehow the personal overflows. It isn't restricted. It isn't contained by the ideological context. There are some moments, I'm thinking particularly of the moments when she describes the death of her child and how she used to be afraid to be in the same room with a dead body. Those are moments of detail that seem to be in excess of anything that the doctrinal purpose of the text would require. Real grief is seeping through in moments, and that's what interests historians about this. It shows you the kind of ruptures, textually, within the ideological formations that Puritan New England is trying to set. She clamps down at the end to a doctrinal meaning, but in the middle, there are really interesting bits. All right, let's leave it there for today. Take a look tonight at the assignments that are posted and ask your TAs um, if you have any questions about it. And we'll listen to one more version of the song. <laughs>